welcome to another episode of Constructive Criticism. I am your fill-in host, Michael, and I am joined by Matt. Hey, how's it going? Uh, it's going pretty good. Uh, this is our more than first attempt at recording this show, but our first attempt at recording this show without Spencer, so we <laughs> are hopeful that uh, things will work out better this time, and that this will be our final take. Yeah, that would be ideal. Um, but, you know, we're not the smartest bunch, so it could, yeah. be, it could be more than once. Yeah, so, more than, you know... more than a few times. If you hear this, cool. If not, it might sound more annoying next time. <laughs> From one or both of us. <laughs> uh, anyways, this week we're going to be talking about some vintage, since Matt has been playing a bunch of it recently... Uh, playing some challenges, stuff like that. And we're also going to talk about using your mana efficiently and uh, sort of the implications that the use of mana has on the game. Uh, if you're interested in listening to some other podcasts about getting better at magic, you can check out a number of other podcasts on our network. Uh, those podcasts right now include Limited Time Only, a podcast about getting better at magic and having a focus on limited specifically uh you can also check out common knowledge a podcast about popper uh with that being said let's jump right into it so the point of the show is always improving we believe if you're not getting better you are getting worse i certainly find that to be true myself uh so matt what did you do this week to keep trying to get better at magic well as usual i just played a lot of magic i think that for me, at least, uh, playing a lot of Magic is actually the key, uh, and specifically playing events that I care about. Um, so often on the weekends, if there's nothing, no Grand Prix or uh, you know RPTQs or anything like that, I will play in the online challenges. And uh, yeah, the last couple of weeks I've been playing the Vintage challenges, and those have been a good time. Uh, I took ninth a couple of weeks ago, and then took eighth this last weekend. So. So what you're saying? It's been mostly going is... pretty well two months from now, you're going to have won, like, you know, your first vintage challenge, yeah. and then you're never going to lose a match ever again. I, I don't anticipate losing any more matches. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a powerful strategy. I'm going to aspire to emulate that. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, I've played some of those with you, and it's definitely been kind of fun to just get to try out a fresh format. So I think we're we're both excited to talk about vintage a little bit today. Definitely. Uh, I spent most of my weekend trying to sort of psych myself up to go to GP Sacramento, and as of today, I am signed up. So, I guess you could say it was mostly a success. I Yeah, it sounds like played... a great success. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, get to go with you and Spencer, so it should be a good time. Uh, I am not 100% sure how I feel about the sealed format, but the draft format was pretty interesting, and uh, I'm excited to get to explore it more over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's always a good feeling to to feel motivated to play, not just because you feel a sense of obligation to continue to try to improve, but just, you know, because you're going to do something kind of fresh and fun and new. And I think that both exploring a new limited format and exploring a new constructed format in Vintage, even if it's the oldest constructed format, sort of... <laughs> did that for both of us in the last couple of weeks yeah definitely i magic is always better when you're having fun yeah and it's it's surprising because just when things are feeling stale they have a way of sort of turning over again and you get a chance to work on some stuff you haven't had a chance to before so kind of fun yep uh anyways we don't have any patron shout outs this week but we do have a patron question and that question is this. I haven't played Standard in a long time because I switched to Popper due to work. I want to get back into PPTQs, but want to get a grip in paper again. So what is the best way to get into a Standard deck at the FNM level, but be prepared to play PPTQs soon? Well, so this question actually has multiple implications, so I think we're going to try to talk about most of them. Um, First of all, there's the, the financial burden of trying to just build a standard deck out of nothing. Um, fortunately, Wizards of the Coast has come out with a product recently that mostly helps this, which is the Challenger decks. Um, they're 
not that far off from tier one right out of the box like often it's because you just need more of one card like the mono red deck for instance i believe had one hazard and like one chandra so obviously you'd rather get you know you'd want to fill those out but it's definitely a great starting place and i think they're only like 25 dollars uh, yeah i think they're i think the msrp is 30 but there's sort of a cool cyclical effect in that you would say oh well Hazaret is prohibitively expensive so even if i can get you know the first one in the challenger deck i'm gonna have trouble getting the rest at a reasonable price but one of the interesting things is that the cards that are printed in these decks sort of cyclically become slightly less expensive as well so i i really yeah, think in some that cases in terms extremely of, less right like heart of yeah Kieran tanked down to like two dollars or whatever yeah heart of kieran's like a couple bucks uh Hazaret is way down from where she was before uh so is chandra so it's actually been really nice for sort of creating price controls on those cards as well so i, I really think that these give you a chance to play standard with if you just want to play it out of the box cool but if you want to add to it i think that these decks are a little more affordable than they were in the past so i think it's a really good Definitely. product from wizards uh and i it's something i hope to see more of in the future right um the other thing that this question potentially implies is the the shift from uh magic online to paper when you're playing paper nothing is nothing is done for you right um you may need to make sure to remember all of your triggers um obviously make sure you're keeping track of life totals and things like that uh just remember that at, at your f and m level if you're trying to get better it's it's usually better to own up to your mistakes rather than try to take take backs uh, so if i'm playing at an f and m and i miss a trigger i will always hold myself accountable for that and i think that that's gonna be the the best way to transition from magic online to paper uh, in the quickest yeah. amount of time i totally agree with that i think just trying to prepare yourself especially if playing in pptqs is your ultimate goal i think just preparing yourself and being comfortable with sort of a competitive rel uh rules enforcement is, is just that's that's really what what you're trying to get comfortable with and i think that holding yourself to your mistakes trying to be careful about maintaining the game state things like that uh, will go a long ways towards making PBDQs feel less intimidating uh, and just something more where, where it's just more of the same. Right. The other thing that I always suggest to people when they're asking how to get to the PPTQ level is to play on Magic Online. It sounds like this person already is doing that, but maybe in Popper rather than Standard. Um, so it can be expensive to maintain both a, st uh, a Magic Online and a Paper Collection. Uh, you can circumvent these with things like mana traders or, you know, sharing collections with your friends online or any number of other things that a lot of us all do. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that the level of competition and the on-demand competition that you can get from Magic Online is irreplaceable in our current uh, current day and age. Yeah, I, I think that definitely you, you can just play a lot more quality matches of Magic in a shorter period of time online as compared to paper. Um so I would definitely recommend continuing to look at playing online uh, to improve as a player. That's, I think, that's something that Matt, Spencer, and I all agree on. Uh, and then the the last thing you should be cognizant of is uh, we are just about to shift into a modern PPDQ season. So in terms of being able to play standard, you should you should take a look at events in your local area and make sure that by the time you have gotten a standard deck together standard pbdqs are a thing that you can do uh because with the release of the next set there's going to be a rotation so you know just just be cognizant of what cards will or will not rotate by the time you're actually looking to play in these events right yeah it could be you could be incentivized to pick a deck that has uh more new cards and fewer old cards for that reason yeah, just and I, I mean, I don't know the exact situation with events close to you, just or how much that matters to you. Just, just something to be aware of. Yep. Uh, so that's a good point. That being said, let's uh, let's move on to our power rankings. Uh, this week we're doing vintage, like we had said, uh, and we're gonna grab the top five decks from MTG Goldfish, largely because there just aren't a whole lot of big vintage events, so. Magic Online aggregation is sort of the the best we can really get as far as metagame percentages and things like that. 
It's true, and I assume, do they only take 5-0 lists into consideration, or do they also uh, work the challenges into the... The challenges are part of it as well, so you, you do... I, I do think that it provides a relatively accurate picture of the metagame. Yeah, more uh, so for Vintage than other formats, I would say, considering uh, that the major events we get are the Vintage challenges. Definitely. I, I think that having the challenges be really, like the primary source of competition for an entire format is sort of interesting, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think that it incentivizes people to play things they find enjoyable rather than always playing the best deck. Uh, and the fact that so many of these decks are sort of unattainable in paper, there, there's just there's something very cool about getting to actually play with Moxon and, you know, stuff oh, like that. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, having just recently gotten into Vintage... Um, I, I would highly recommend it if it's if it's possible for you to play some vintage online or I mean if you're if you're able to play it in paper that sounds great too but uh, for most of us that's not really realistic. Yeah, just just for reference, looking at MTG Goldfish, the top five decks, basically the the blue decks average just over 500 tickets. Shops is about 350. Dredge is about 150. And uh, most other things are coming in uh, between two and five hundred, so it's actually like a fair bit cheaper than modern or legacy online, which right. is kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. So the number five deck in our power rankings this week is Check Pile. Uh, I don't know that the naming convention is quite perfect, given how different I feel this is. Uh, when compared to its legacy counterpart, but it is sort of reminiscent in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, definitely. Um, it plays some of the same cards, but the overarching strategy, I feel, is very different. Mostly the overlap is uh, Leovold and Deathbright Shaman, and, like, some Planeswalkers. Yeah, I when I look at this deck, what I really see is it's almost it's almost more of, like, a blue kind of hate bears or stack style deck where what we're really trying to do is play a quick Leovold and then use counter magic to grind our opponents out of the game. Yeah, it's kind of like a, a hybrid uh, hate bears fish deck, right? Um, in that you kind of uh, you try to get on the board pretty early and then your creatures act as disruption, like Deathrite Shaman uh, in combination with Wastelands or Strip Mines can often just steal a game one from Dredge. Um, and Leovold is pretty great against any of the any of the blue decks, really, but especially against Paradoxical Outcome decks. Um, and then you have the Trigon Predator to try to fight against any kind of artifact things, mostly shops. So it's kind of interesting how much, how much uh, utility your creatures have in that way. Yeah, I think when you look at decks like this, one of the biggest sort of takeaways that I've had as I've started looking at just what's available in this format, you get a lot of information on how a deck would like a game to play out based on sort of how many pieces of power it's playing. And given the relative lack of like two cost spells in this deck, you're not really playing a lot of Moxen. You're only playing the on color ones, typically. Uh, and I think that that's pretty telling when you look at a deck that's playing less artifact mana, it's typically more reactive. Well, and I would also say that the reason not to play off-color Moxon in a deck like this is because your color requirements just don't allow it, right? Like, Leovold actually costs three different colors of mana. Um, Deathrite Shaman costs one color of mana. Often they're playing Deck Faden, which costs two different colors of mana for three. So you're just right. really, you're not looking at a lot of colorless mana symbols in your casting costs. Right, and it's not really about ramping things out as much as it is responding to what your opponent plays. Right. Right, you're just playing a little bit of a more reactive strategy in general, and I think that that's, that shows. So some of the lists are three colors, some are four colors, uh, some opting for more Jace the Mind Sculptor, some opting for Dak Fade, and then like Pyroblast style effects. Yeah, I, I am unsure why anybody would play the three color version. Like, I assume that you get more access to Wastelands, but... Deck Faden can act as a wasteland sometimes when when you're able to steal your opponent's mocks or you know soul ring or whatever, and that card has just been 
overperforming for me in every game of Vintage I've played, uh, both with and against it. Yeah, it, it's a really powerful card, and I, I think that the, uh, just the ability, it really warps the game around it a lot of the time. Um, it's not even necessarily fair to call it a wasteland, in the sense that stealing something is so much more powerful than destroying it. Right, that, that's true. It's, it's, uh, it's like a Stone Rain and a Rampant Growth all in one. Yeah, uh, but this deck is kind of sweet, and I think if you're looking to play, you know, some vintage, and you you do like the Deathrite Shaman style decks, I I think that Leovold is kind of it gives just its own unique stamp to a deck, and that that's really apparent when you look at at the way that people have built these decks. I I think that if you like playing the check pile decks in Legacy there's still a lot of kind of similar feeling things going on, even if the overarching strategy isn't quite the same. Right. And I, it, this is also uh, people's only place to go to play Deathrite Shaman mostly, right? I mean, there's Commander still, yeah. but, yeah. It's it's about it. It's about the last holdout, so, yep. you know, if you got to get your fix, I, I understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this deck is, it looks like about just under 8% of the metagame online right now. So not tremendously oh, wow. popular, but uh, sort of uh, one of the, like, sort of on the verge of busting into the very top tier, which I would argue is really the next four. The next four are, like, pretty clearly more played than the rest. That's uh, true, although I... I, I associate most strongly with Vintage these days. Yeah, I, I am actually surprised to hear you say that it's 8% of the metagame, though that's that's quite a big number. For a deck that's uh, a little bit off the metagame, I think one of the things is there are just very few, like really rogue decks popping up. So the top twelve are all at least about two percent, right? Um, so th there are just very few decks that are like one ofs, like that, yeah. that only have a uh, right. that only They're... have like one hit in Vintage compared Their to... Their unclassified category is much lower than in other formats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that there's just such a high power level in general that there's a little bit more uh, sort of clumping right. in, in one of these really top-level strategies. Uh, so coming in in number four, and kind of what I would say right now, the bottom of, like, the Tier 1 Vintage strategies, we have Dredge. And Dredge is really a bizarre Baghdad theme deck. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the deck oftentimes does not function at all without a bizarre Baghdad. So uh, it plays things like Serum Powders to facilitate mulliting because you're supposed to mull again to one for bizarre Baghdad. Yeah, it, it's kind of bizarre. If you've ever played basically any deck in any other format, this... Dredge does just not really resemble playing Magic. <laughs> Certainly not. You're, you're sort of <laughs> opting out of Magic and playing a different game instead. Uh, yeah. For better or worse. I mean, especially with the Vintage version more than any other, right? Like, the idea of mulliganing to 1 because you're more favored on a 1 with a Vizar than a, any 7 is is pretty uh, pretty incredible. Yeah, it, it's kind of out there, but it, it's kind of neat, too. It, it's amazing how uh, just... How consistently powerful and how consistently good your game ones are with Dredge. Uh, the combination of Mental Misstep and Force of Will uh, with just an incredibly powerful Bizarre Baghdad engine. And yeah, it's, act it's it's actually impressive how disruptive Dredge can be as well. Like I I remember playing Storm against Dredge at one point, and I got like Force of Will three times and Mental Misstep twice, and I was like, wow, that seems like... <laughs> it seems like so yeah. much. But the thing is, like, it's not it's not a quantity deck, right? So they're actually, when they're pitching to Bizarre Baghdad, these are the cards they're keeping mostly. So it, they actually get to draw three cards towards their Force of Wills and their Mental Missteps every turn while facilitating their own game plan. Or, sorry, it's draw two, but yes. Well, and then one for your turn as well, right? So well, you're not taking that draw step a lot of times. Um, I guess you're not taking the, the Bizarre draw steps uh, you're once not, you start but, getting things going, uh, but... But a lot of the time, your Narcobibas especially are totally free to pitch as are additional copies of Mental Misstep and Force of Will. So the, the deck just like is a surprisingly good Mental Misstep and Force of Will deck because 
like Matt said, the quantity just doesn't matter at all. Pretty much just a single Bazaar of Baghdad and nothing else will win a game unchecked by turn four or so every time. Yeah, uh, that would be the, so, the absolute latest I would expect if you have no disruption. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of on the, like, mulligan to two or three plan. Right. If you don't have any dredgers to go with your bazaar initially, it can be, like, turn four. If you do have even a single dredger, it's almost always turn three. Um, so it's just incredibly powerful and linear. Uh, one of the weirdest things about playing vintage in general is just how much every deck basically has to sideboard for dredge. Yeah, it, de uh, so it definitely... what do the sideboarded games look like? It definitely cuts into the sideboard slots, um... Almost no deck actually has a 15 card sideboard in Vintage because you have to have, you know, six or seven graveyard hate uh, pieces just for dredge. I shouldn't say just for dredge, even, but even mostly the, for dredge. Even the pure combo decks have to play some. Right. So basically, no one the post board gets games. Away with none. Right. The post board games often, um, often look like them trying to land some piece of graveyard hate and you trying to not let that happen. Um, Mental Misstep actually functions very well in this respect because it stops Graf Digger's Cage and Relic of Progenitus just right off the bat. Um. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, th the Nature's Claims and Hollow Ones were basically coming in in just about every matchup, as far yeah. as I could tell. Yeah, definitely. Hollow One is also an incredibly powerful way to beat the graveyard interaction just by being able to cast things. Um, you know, Bizarre Baghdad is like the broken version of Burning Inquiry because you always get to keep your hollow ones. Right. Well, and one of the cards that you see a lot of against this deck that hollow one also beats pretty handily is a Containment Priest. Um, right. So sometimes your opponents will, will have some sort of a Containment Priest draw and like two hollow ones will basically beat it single-handedly. Yeah. If you even need the second one. I mean, honestly, they're not going to be able to take four that many times. No, it's, it's true. It, it depends on the rest of the game, but Hollow One is definitely a powerful sideboard option. And I think that this deck in general is just fairly interesting. Um, it, it's kind of wild to be playing Serum Powder with the intention of using it every single time that it's in your hand, basically. Right. Yeah, it's, it's actually one of the little interesting things that we talked about a little bit was... What, which kind of hands are you supposed to actually uh, naturally mulligan, even if they have a serum powder in them? Like, what what would it take, right? Like, three bridge from below? Very, yes, we came up <laughs> with very few examples. Right. Uh, kind of an interesting exercise, though. Yeah. So Dredge is, like, one of, the, one of the decks that's been good in Vintage for a long time, and kind of what I would say right now, at least based on the MTG Goldfish percentages, is at sort of the bottom of the tier one metagame, uh, and it is at just over 10% at the moment. Uh, moving on, we have Paradoxical Storm uh, coming in next, and there are a whole bunch of slightly different variants, but this is a really neat deck, so so what excites you about Paradoxical Storm? Also, I, I would say that there are, there are several slightly different variants, and then there are wildly different variants. Um, Paradoxical Outcome Storm has actually evolved to the point where it often won't play any cards with the word Storm on them. It actually just plays like a... not necessarily a mentor control deck, although it does have controlling elements with the Force of Wills, um, but more like a mentor combo deck. Like, it just... it, it will tr do everything it can to draw a mentor early and often, and play it as soon as you get it most of the time. And then... <laughs> you you almost always win the game the turn you untap with Mentor. Yeah, I, I would say when you look at this compared to some of the more controlling Mentor builds, the biggest thing that you see is lack of one mana interaction uh, instead of like, or zero mana interaction instead of, so we're just playing Force Will, we're not playing Mental Missteps or anything like that. Right. And instead, we're playing a ton of artifact mana, usually like somewhere in the realm of like 15 to 20 artifacts depending on the exact build right uh, and all of our one drops are like cantrips or tutors the deck is basically just set up to try to ramp out a mentor and from there 
find you know some combination of like recall time walk voltaic key time vault right and you have win with that right yeah i was gonna say you have some alternate win conditions with your uh tinker package you do play the voltaic key time vault thing um and honestly voltaic key has a lot of modes in the deck uh it fixes your mana sometimes it will in combination with sensei's divining top draw you a card and uh, as well as you know just winning the game with time vault Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a really it's a really interesting deck. I, I think that one of the things that's maybe a little bit hard to envision until you've cast it is the paradoxical outcome is basically copies you know two through five of ancestral recall. Uh, it's sometimes actually better than ancestral recall. Yeah, I would um, say often. In fact, I would it, about fifty percent yeah. of the time it's recall, and about fifty percent of the time it's better than that. <laughs> so it comes with a fairly a fairly problematic at times deck building restriction. I mean, I would say that the biggest issue that I have with this deck is just that you have to play so much fast mana that at times you're really, really heavy on the fast mana in your draws. Uh, you, you're playing a lot of air. Yeah, you definitely end up in the all dressed up and nowhere to go scenarios a fair amount where you just have, you know, four... <laughs> You know, four Moxen or Mox-like cards and then just nothing to actually do with them, but even from those stages of the game, if you draw any cantrip and can find, like, a paradoxical outcome with it, you know, now things are really happening for you, and you can often, you know, draw most, if not all, of your deck in one turn. Yeah, and one, one of the things, too, is that, you know, with cards like Demonic Tutor, Merchant Scroll, even Knight's Whisper, Brainstorm, that kind of stuff, because you have so much fast mana, a lot of the time you're able to kind of go all at once. You can go from nothing to winning the game, basically, with one paradoxical outcome. And I think that's something I maybe didn't quite appreciate at first. I, the deck is just incredibly explosive, and more than anything else, you can win from spots where it's hard to conceive how exactly you could win. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about this uh, in Modern in our testing a lot, like, or whatever other format, like, you know, we'll say basically our opponent needs, uh, it takes Ancestral Recall to start, and then Time Walk is probably the, you know, the way that he can actually win this game, and that kind of stuff actually happens in Vintage. <laughs> right, well, and with this deck in particular, when you're playing a deck with, like, Demonic Tutor, Merchant Scroll, plus four Paradoxical Outcomes, and the actual Recall, you have a lot of cards that are, you know, like draw four to five and make a bunch of mana right so you have you have a lot of sequences where you can go from kind of i can't really figure out exactly what it's going to take for me to win this game <laughs> to oh wow my opponent's dead on board right definitely. Uh, and you, you can just flip the switch really quickly and it, it's i think this is probably like if I had never played Vintage before and wanted to play something that felt like it had an incredibly high power level, this is probably where I would start. Oh yeah, this this will give you the the uh, authentic Vintage feel. Like, if your hand doesn't have a bunch of power in it or something akin to power, like if it doesn't look like a Vintage hand, uh, it's usually a mulligan with this deck. Yeah, the, the, your hands have to be kind of broken. But yeah. the deck is very good at doing that, so it's really a good time. Uh, and I think it's quite good as well. Realistically, what do you what do you think you're looking to play against with Paradoxal Outcome, and what are you hoping to avoid? Uh, I think Shops is a really good matchup. Um, I think that Dredge is a good matchup. Um, I think the Fair decks are slightly unfavorable, but not that bad. Like the uh, the Jeskai Mentor decks and the Standstill decks and what have you. Yeah, my my experience in the games that. Uh, we were playing together with with this one was that you are a little bit softer to counter magic than to discard at times. Definitely, um, it's um, it's much different than the the dark petition storm deck in that fashion because dark petition storm is actually pretty great on the stack, but not as good in the uh, in the hand. Whereas this one kind of flips that yeah. because you can play out all your mana first, so like you can't really be targeted by discard and like. It's a one-card combo deck, right? Like, Paradoxical Outcome is the combo. Right. Well, and a lot of the time you're able to sort of set it up in such a way that everything happens at once. Right. Right, that, like, the the discard spells just don't really do anything against you, and 
you can draw enough cards to then have interaction against combo or just win the game on the spot. Right. Uh, it's actually very so. hard to interact with this deck in any other fashion other than just specifically counter magic. Um, it's it's a lot better against the graveyard hate and stuff than uh, versions of Dark Petition Storm, as well as like being better against uh, any of the lock pieces out of shops. Uh, that's one of the main reasons Definitely. why the why the matchup is favorable because you just it's not that hard to cast your spells when you when you're able to develop all of your mana on turn one and then you can eventually find Hercules Recall to actually kill them. Definitely, I mean the the biggest problem for shops in this matchup is that sometimes shops is on the draw. Right. Um. So I, I think this deck is is a really good time and uh, something that is probably really appealing to a lot of people, uh, just in the sense that it. It allows you to play the most vintage feeling games by a pretty substantial margin. Yep. Uh, so coming in in second, we do have Ravager Shops. It's at about 16% of the metagame right now. Uh, and these lists are playing, at least typically, a lot less lock pieces than in the past. Well, I think that most of that has to do with the fact that they are all restricted. It's it's not like they're optionally, or yeah, it's not optional no, to it, play less true. lock pieces. <laughs> it's true. It it looks more like modern affinity or like the the legacy, you know, pseudo shop stack. Right. Yeah. It's kind it of does a, like old fashioned stacks these days. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're really uh, banking on the synergies of uh, walking ballista and arcbound ravagers in a lot of matchups. Um, and then you still play some some you know disruptive pieces like Phyrexian Revoker. Um, it plays the Lodestone Golem that you can play. Still, uh, the one Chalice that you can play, the one Thorn of Amethyst that you can play, uh, the one Trinisphere that you can play. So, I mean, as as you can see, just listing these cards off, like a lot of this, a lot of the lock pieces are restricted. Um, you still get to play four Spear of Resistances, so that that's nice for sure. Um, especially when you have lands that make three mana, and mostly your opponent's lands are making one. Um, yeah, I I think that like shops is funny in that it's changed so much over the last few years just out of necessity, right? Like this was a deck that at one point was very lock piece heavy and had a fantastic combo matchup, and now instead we're mostly sort of a a beat down deck with lock pieces as an afterthought. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and it has flipped the entire dynamic of of your matchups. Like I think that. In its current form, you're mostly a slam dunk against any of the fair decks, and a little bit soft to the combo decks. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, I, I think that this is maybe most telling. I, most most of the shop decks now are playing at least one or two copies of Null Rod in the sideboard, which is sort of unthinkable given that <laughs> you are literally playing an artifact based beatdown deck. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it would be know. it would be basically to put it into perspective, it would be. Like modern affinity citing in stony silence, <laughs> because you know yeah, K KCI it's... was so rampant or whatever. Right. It it's very it's very weird. It it does not feel like a card that should be in the sideboard. Yet you look at it and you actually probably cite it in quite a bit, and it's a fairly good sideboard card. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's it's the number one card you're looking for against paradoxical outcome storm. It's your best way to best way to win by so much. Yeah, it, it it's very it, it's just very interesting. Uh, I I feel like the dynamics of this deck have just changed immensely over the last couple of years. So definitely, and I mean, I kind of fun I, to take a look at. I played a little bit of the uh, the lock the lock shops deck, uh, the stack shops decks, and they they certainly had some play to them. Um, a lot of it was sequencing though, and trying to figure out how to how to bait out counter spells, um, which can actually get a little bit tougher than you would think because. It, like say hypothetically you're trying to bait out, uh, bait out a force of will with a sphere of resistance so that you can resolve chalice of the void well that becomes a little bit problematic if the sphere of resistance resolves instead of getting countered because often you're actually taxing your own mana when you cast the spells in the wrong order <laughs> right and on the flip side if you cast the chalice of the void and then it you know gets countered immediately right you're left sort of wondering if I'd cast that in the opposite order would I have the one I actually wanted in play? Definitely. And so, in my experience, uh, playing the Ravager Shops deck, this is actually one of, if not the hardest decks I've ever tried to play. Um, 
from everything from mulligan decisions to sequencing to combat math, everything is just very, very difficult with this deck. Um, it's hard to, like, some of your hands look like they don't do vintage things. I, I mean, they you're, you're usually not keeping hands that can't make three mana on turn one, so, like, either a workshop or, like, an ancient tomb plus a mox or, you know, a soul ring plus anything else like mana crypt. But it, it often looks like, you know, just a ragtag crew of Foundry Inspectors and Walking Ballistas and Chief of the Foundries isn't really going to get there, but it definitely does in the fair matchups. Yeah, it, it's just kind of finding the balance, right? I mean, obviously, the, the hands that are casting a turn one Trinisphere are fantastic in every matchup, but when you're yeah. having to decide on some of the more marginal stuff, uh, you know, how much can my artifact beat down deck that's going to be like hard casting a Walking Ballista for two on turn two? Is, is that good enough? What are we looking at? And I think that sort of understanding how to leverage your draws that lean more that way, uh, and just like you said, how to mulligan correctly in different matchups is really, really tricky. Right. Because for for all of the you know for all of the joking that people do about Mishra's Workshop, this deck actually has a remarkably low power level in a lot of ways. Like you're playing a lot of cards that really just aren't especially impressive. Yeah, just aren't cards that you would consider vintage playable. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, we're playing like Chief of the Foundry, Foundry Inspector, uh, Hangerback Walker, Walking Bliss, Argbound Ravager. I mean, none of those are exactly powerhouses. Right. And you know, like like we said, you do still have the the completely broken bonkers hands sometimes, where you just you know turn one cast like mana crypt, black lotus, uh, sphere of resistance, trinosphere, whatever. You know, it's lodestone golem. Sure, where you you just play out your entire hand, and your opponent now has to pay three for their first spell, and or getting attacked for five every turn. Right. I mean, you you definitely have hands like that, but they're much less common than they used to be, and I, I think that. Although Stax is a very good deck, I think it's actually, like you're saying, it's remarkably tricky to play. We're not just we're we're not built around trying to resolve one spell in the same way that Paradoxical Outcome is. We can't ride a Leovold to victory. We don't have Bazaar of Baghdad, right? Like compared to a lot of the other decks that we've highlighted, I, I think a lot of the games require, like you said, more combat math, more figuring out how to play around removal spells more understanding how your lock pieces are going to interact with your opponent's game plan compared to your own. Right, uh, and it, that, I mean, just... adds really interesting dimensions with Arcbound Ravager, too, because you you have the ability to suck off your lock pieces whenever you want, but it's often a gamble, because while it lets you cast some of your spells, or potentially, you know, deal them more damage, it also allows your opponent to potentially cast spells. Right, yeah, I... I... Definitely it was surprised the first couple of matches I saw with this deck in that while it does do some really broken things, it is very much like an all or nothing broken kind of deck. Like when it's doing broken things, your opponent mostly does not get to participate in that game of magic. And when it's not doing broken things, you're left feeling very sort of underwhelmed by your average power level in comparison to what your opponent is getting to do. Yeah, you're definitely trying to get the game in inches when you don't have the completely broken draws. That being said, I've definitely had uh, many, many draws where my opponent just didn't get to cast a spell the entire game. Right, it, but it, it's it's interesting. I, I think that before seeing this deck in action a fair bit, I probably would have overrated the, like, the percentage of games that are completely uninteractive or games where your opponent is just decimated by lock pieces. Yeah, I agree. I mean, almost everybody that I talk to about Vintage that doesn't play uh, you know, always says, oh yeah, you know, Workshops, it's completely broken. Um, but, I I mean, it is the best deck, but not by nearly as much as you would think. No, it, it it's definitely it definitely has competition. It's, uh... Yeah, it's, it's completely justifiable to play any of the decks on this list. I, I totally agree. Um, so the deck that comes in at number one at, I think, about 16.5% is Jeskai Mentor. And this is... It, it's another Monastery Mentor deck, but it's much more controlling than its Paradoxical Outcome counterpart. Yeah, this deck is, is just a great time. Um, 
And this is one of the few decks that I've played personally in Vintage where your hands do not need to look like Vintage hands at all. Like, I've had hands that look like pretty medium Legacy hands in one easily. Frankly, this deck is a lot like the... Uh, it's a lot like the check pile deck in some ways in that you're just playing so much more of a reactive game and you're playing so many, you know, single blue, single red spells that the fast mana just doesn't do quite as much for you as it does for a lot of decks. Uh, and as a result, most of these lists are only playing the on-color Moxon and the Lotus. Yeah, definitely. And, I I mean, it's one of the easiest decks to play in Vintage if you're just getting into it. It's, it's also one of the most fun decks to play. I think I actually enjoy this deck the most, and it's it's actually not that not that difficult to play as far as vintage decks go yeah a lot of it like you had said before is kind of it's kind of point and click uh and it, it's just more than even being point and click it, i think that your experience with playing good magic elsewhere ports better to a deck like this or to the check pile deck than it does to say uh paradoxical outcome right yeah i mean with this deck, it's 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 interesting. One of, one of the things that makes it very easy to play is like like we were saying, it it is a little bit point and click. Um, basically, if you have a spell that you can use to stop something your opponent's doing, you're most of the time supposed to do it. Um, basically, misstepping the first step that you can misstep, mana draining the first thing that you can mana drain. Uh, if they have a target for lightning bolt or pyroblast, use them right now. So it can be a little bit uninteresting in those ways, but you still have uh, tutors in like Merchant Scroll, and you still have Ancestral Recall, a bunch of Planeswalker activated abilities, you have Snapcaster Mages, so there are still decisions to be made. Definitely, and I, I think that just the kind of the, the deck building decisions are pretty interesting as well. One of the coolest things about this deck, in my experience, it looks like most of the lists are main decking a Stony Silence these days, and often have another one in the board as well. Uh, and that card is incredibly powerful right now in Vintage. Uh, even the Shops decks... So, like, the Shops decks would side in Null Rod against Combo decks, but they can also struggle against Sony Silence just because of the density of artifact mana and the number of activated abilities on some of the creatures. Oh, definitely. I mean, so, it's, it just stops Ravager, Hangerback, Walker, Steel Overseer. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty absurd against Shops if, they're, if, if you're not... If it's not going to completely cripple you, it's going to it's going to do a lot of work against them. <laughs> yeah, and this deck is built in a way that it's not really that likely to cripple you. Uh, so I think that's kind of cool. I think that like the deck fade ins, this deck does a lot of things that sort of remind me of like the check pile lists, where instead of instead of being entirely focused on the most powerful plays it can make, it's focused on being built more efficiently for sort of grindy, slug it out games, and then forcing your opponent into that style of game. Right. I mean, I, I think realistically, like when you look at this versus the red splash check pile lists, the main difference really is just like Snapcaster Mages versus Deathrite Shaman and Monastery Mentor versus Leovold, and then just, you know, sort of trimming spells to make that work. Right. It's, they they play a little bit higher density of, of, of creatures in the check pile deck, but yeah, it's it is it is similar in some ways. Yeah, um, so I, I think that this deck is again like it's a lot of really powerful stuff, but I think that this one is maybe a little bit more accessible in a lot of ways. Uh, in, in terms of game plan, it, it's just I think it's a little bit easier to figure out than some of the other stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a much more uh, intuitive game It's plan. a traditional control deck, right. right? It's it's really a pretty traditional control deck. Definitely. I mean, I it did have one game with the deck where I was able to just like, you know, force well my opponent's first spell, then play Lotus Strip Mine, and just play a Mentor on that turn and Strip Mine them, and then play like two Moxes or whatever, and then the next turn uh, you know, killed them with it. And that was pretty great, but those those games are few and far between with a deck like this. Definitely. I, I think that that's the thing, like even the more sort of mopey vintage decks have the potential for really absurd draws, right? I mean, we're still playing Ancestral Recall, Monastery Mentor, a bunch of power, Time Walk, like, you know, we're describing this as, like, the fairest deck, 
even the Ferris deck sometimes just goes crazy on turn one. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there was there was a point when all the Ferris decks used to play uh, Tinker and Voltaic Key and Time Vault in their decks. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely. I, I think the restriction of Monastery Mentor has moved us away from these heavy artifact mana packages in like every single deck. Right. But. And just the the yeah, there's there's the, still a lot of that. The ability to include something powerful in your main deck, like uh, Null Rod or Stony Silence, is also a big appeal of not running quite so much artifact mana, um, because it, it's pretty easy to just say, oh, I can just play this Mox over a land because it's you know effectively the same card a lot of times, but um, it does it does hinder you if your opponent's playing Null Rod or if you're trying to play Null Rod or Stony Silence, or whatever. Definitely, I I think that just getting a chance to sort of look at what exists and what's available and what has been doing well in Vintage is, is really interesting. It's It's been a fun format to explore. Uh, there's just, there's a lot of a lot of interesting play and lines to most of the top decks, and I, I really think that if it's not something that you've played before but you have the chance to play, it's probably something you'd really enjoy. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so that about wraps it up as far as Vintage this week. Uh, our training grounds is on using your mana. So, fundamentally, when we talk about using your mana, uh, and using your mana efficiently, what, is that, what does that mean to you? What comes to mind? Well, so, there are a lot of things that come to mind, come to mind with using your mana efficiently. Basically, you can assume that all the cards in your deck are good on rate as far as mana goes, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be playing them. So the ability to use all of your mana every turn means that you're just gaining an advantage over your opponent who's not using their mana every turn because you're getting more mana worth of cards. Right. So often when decks that are trying to win quickly are playing effectively, they're leveraging this sort of mana advantage and instead of necessarily trying to end up with the most powerful spells, they're trying to end up with the highest volume of spells being cast over, you know. If I'm able to spend 20 of my mana in the time that you've spent 4, it's just going to be very challenging for you to win. Yeah, definitely. Um, and mana advantage uh, specifically can mean a lot of different things. There, there are several ways to generate mana advantage. Uh, things like Cascade generate mana advantage. Um, as well as card advantage. Um, things like rampant growth generate mana advantage. Um, and these things can be very powerful because it means that you are able to use more mana more quickly, even if your opponent's spending all their mana every turn. If you're able to you know, play something that costs 5 mana when they're only playing something that costs 3, that can often swing a game. Yeah, and I think that like one of the most fundamental examples that you really see as far as mana advantage, and one of kind of the most, just the most basic things that comes up a lot is trying to use your mana efficiently. So, you know, if I have a 3-drop and two 2-drops, two and I have 3 mana, you know, why am I incentivized to play the 3-drop this turn and the 2-2-drops two two next turn? And I think that that, like, at its core is sort of like the the most basic mana advantage concept that we can present. And yeah. I, I think that it's pretty clear why you would generally want to spend all of your mana both turns. Um but one of the interesting things about magic is that, you know, we're we're really trying to learn these rules in order to learn when to violate them, right? And I think that as you play at a higher level and as you see more players play at a higher level you start to learn to sort of question question when different plays are better and understand how spending your mana differently can create value in different situations. Yeah, those are always the most interesting games to me when you're watching uh, when you're watching coverage of an event or watching something you know in, in paper and you could see a player that is very good and they choose not to curve out for whatever reason like they decide to play the the two drop this turn instead of the three drop and those those particular plays are very interesting to me because they definitely know these rules they know that uh it's better to spend all of your mana every turn because then you're more likely to be able to cast two spells in one turn later or 
you know, just generally uh, gaining an advantage by by spending as much mana as possible because your cards are worth the mana that they cost. So generally assumed three drops are better than two drops, and so on. Right, and I, I think that where this really gets interesting is that sometimes the like the the interactions of the reasons that are driving this are relatively simple, right? Like sometimes we're trying to play around sensor or syncopate for one or something like that. But sometimes you might be trying to do something like represent a spell, whether you have it or not. You might be trying to uh, get your opponent to play a card that you believe your three drop will line better will line up better against next turn, right? I mean, maybe you're trying to hold a goblin chain whirler. Maybe you don't want to play a whirler virtuoso into your opponent's open mana. Right. Um, so there are all kinds of spots where, in where while mana advantage is a factor in determining the plays we make, it's not the only factor. And I, I think that one of the ways that this becomes really interesting is when we start to look at how exchanges work, right? So say your opponent so you let's say we're playing a team or energy mirror and our opponent has passed a turn with two lands up and we draw a land and have the choice to play either a servant of the conduit or a uh whirl of virtuoso right now if the if the servant of the conduit surviving is especially important there are multiple factors that might go into casting it or not casting it, but if if it's more of a throwaway creature, we might decide that what I really want out of the Servant of the Conduit is the energy, so that I can make Thopters later, but what I really want out of the Whirler Virtuoso is the Thopter, so if my opponent has open mana, I'm not going to play this, I'm not going to play the Whirler Virtuoso into it, because I don't want it to die before I'm able to make a Thopter. Right. And yeah, I think in situations like that, what you're really trying to do is impact the way that your opponent is able to spend their mana. Well, and it's important to note that if your opponent decides to hold up a removal spell, rather, like if they have the option to play something of their own, like a proactive game, um, like even something like a Search for Azkanta or whatever, and decide to hold up a Harness Lightning instead, that mana has already been spent. They've already they've already invested that mana into the the Harness Lightning. And if you give them the very best target, then that mana was well spent. Whereas if you give them something that you're actually more okay with dying, then the mana, you're actually gaining an advantage by them having to spend their mana a little bit worse. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And one of the things that I like about that is that it gives you a lot of control over the game, right? It's not as simple as, well, your opponent had Harness Lightning or a Braid or Doom Blade or whatever, and there was nothing you could do about it. Every time you're electing to cast a specific spell over something else, that that is the kind of, like, early turn sequencing is the kind of thing where really great players will separate themselves from, you know, merely players who are avoiding giant mistakes. Right. And, and the, the, I, I, I think just, it, it's understanding how you want to fundamentally move the game forward. Right. To give, to give another example of a way that we used to generate um, mana advantage... Uh, through making our opponents hold up removal spells. Um, back in the days of Marty Vehicles versus Green Black Snake before a braid was printed, you used to be able to actually uh, basically strand a mana almost every turn by not crewing Heart of Kieran into it. Like They would eventually be forced with the choice of either casting a spell of their own or holding up Fatal Push. And every turn that they held up Fatal Push and you just cast something that wasn't, you know, and didn't activate the Heart of Kieran they would fall farther and farther behind because they are playing off-curve the entire game. Right, and I think that one of the really important things to understand there is that different decks have different costs to continuing to hold up mana. So when your opponent is playing a deck largely comprised of like Disallows and Glimmer of Geniuses, trying to strand a Fatal Push in their hand is much harder to do than it is against a deck like Green Black Snake where they're really trying to play on curve. Yeah, that's definitely um, that's definitely a very good point. Um, any any not, that not that has it means you of... should always crew. Uh, yeah. Not that it means you should always crew in open mana, but I think like fundamentally the idea of stone raining your opponent is much more effective when well that the... stone rain is meaningful. Yeah, it's 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 important to know um, specifically on what turns you'd like to do something like that. Like if I'm playing against Esper Control and I know they have Glimmer of Geniuses in their deck, I'm way more likely to crew of Heart of Kieran into a Fatal Push on turn four. <laughs> because not only do I think that it will stop them from glimmering that turn, but it actually wastes three of their mana a lot of the times. 
Right. So I, I think that that's a really good point where it's not necessarily just about the exchange directly, but then from that exchange, what, how else does that impact the game, right? If, right. if I believe strongly that my opponent has a removal spell, it might be better to play a Heart of Kirin that I'm going to be even unable to crew for whatever reason. Again, this this is more interesting if we sort of ignore a braid, but <laughs> just generally, like trying to strand our opponent's mana is is powerful. But I, I think understanding like how you're going to leverage that into actually making uh, winning plays is maybe even more important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're if you're ending up in a scenario where you're wasting their mana, but the mana doesn't actually impact the game, then it's it's mostly pointless and oftentimes you can be handicapping yourself by by taking suboptimal lines to do that um i remember we had right. we had a specific uh game in playtesting that we talked about pretty extensively where um i was playing blue black gate to the afterlife and you were playing red black aggro and i knew you had the abrade in hand or i had a I had a pretty good read that you had the abrade um and i ended up with seven creatures in the graveyard and a gate to the afterlife in play and had the mana to activate it but i figured out pretty quickly that as long as I held up two mana for Gate to the Afterlife, you would have to hold up two mana for a braid, and that was just going to going to be true for the entire game, basically. Um, assuming that you didn't have any other instant speed spells that you could cast, it w- it would choke two mana on your turn for sure, basically. And right. I had to and I that's... had to make the decision of whether whether you're spending two mana on your turn was uh, better for you than me spending two mana on my turn was for me. Right, and I think that that's pretty interesting. And then one of the the flip side is that at some point, you have to decide that maybe you're out of drawing, you know, a second gate to the afterlife before you have seven mana and could just pop both in the same sequence. Might be more valuable than double stone raining me. So right. there get to you you get to a lot of points in games where mana using your mana efficiently becomes a trade off for like raw card advantage or something like that and the trick is sort of deciding the the trick is finding sort of the tipping points for each right right playing inefficiently to play around spells your opponent may or may not have can be a really powerful strategy but i i think that trying to get a read on when it makes sense to Strand of, to attempt to strand a fatal push in your opponent's hand versus when it makes sense to just crew Heart of Kirin into open mana and is is really kind of one of the key points and trying to understand how to get better at that just by understanding a matchup better uh, being able to get a better read on your opponent um, understanding the information that you're sending from both sides with how you sequence and how you tap your lands uh that kind of stuff is is really challenging and one of the things that's a lot harder to get better at but one of one of the ways that basically everyone can continue to improve right and i mean it's more it more feeds into the overarching theme of magic which is like you know what is this game about what 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 is what is the important fundamental uh, principle of this particular game right like if if me stranding this mana this turn doesn't do anything then i missed it completely right and that's the way that you know that's the way great magic players uh, beat worse magic players on a regular basis is just having a better fundamental understanding of what they're trying to do in a game and being right about what they're trying to do in a game more often. Right, so when when you're looking at these exchanges, it's not just a matter of, you know, how much is this handicapping my opponent, but it's how much is this handicapping my opponent relative to how much is it handicapping me. Well, and more, right? more to, more to the I, point, like... Am I making... Is this the way that I'm that I'm trying to beat them, right? Like, is is them burning this mana right now the way that it's actually going to lead to a victory for me? Um, like, it's it's possible that uh, that kind of exchange isn't even the way that you can win a game. Like, often sometimes you actually just have to burn them out of cards or you know anything else. Sure. Or you have a second heart of Kieran, and really the secret is that you need them to fatal push the first one so that you could, right like right. D- depending on. It, and I think that that's maybe the hardest thing about magic in general is just that like it's it's very adaptive, right? We're we're constantly working with changing information with a combination of changing and hidden information, uh, and trying to make decisions that give us the most outs going forward. And I think that understanding when 
to try to press your mana advantage versus when to try to leverage each card individually to make it as powerful as it possibly can be is really interesting. I, I think that like we saw this a lot with the card Goblin Chain Whirler, right? It's really nice if you can clean up a small creature with a Goblin Chain Whirler or deal a relevant point of damage to a Planeswalker, but it's also a 3-3 first strike, so you're relatively incentivized to cast it if it's something you're able to cast. Definitely. I, I think that just like getting better at these exchanges, getting better at sort of understanding how games play out in different matchups, uh, having a feel for what what sort of situations you really need to avoid and what situations you're trying to put yourself into. Uh, it, it's really the key to getting better, especially in solved, like relatively solved metagames. Um, and that happens by basically the end of every standard format. So I, I think when you're looking at like just playing playing games where your event results are more about gameplay and less about deck selection, these are the things that you really have to try to get better at. Right. I, I would also like to point out a common misconception in mana exchanges. Um, people often say things like, you know, I spent two mana to uh, to deal with something that cost that my opponent five mana, right? Now, that makes a lot of sense if you can actually do something with the remaining mana. Like say, hypothetically, I cast down your 5-drop, but then do nothing else with the rest of my turn. Well, that cast down costs 5 mana, right? It doesn't actually matter that the card printed uh, says 2 mana. If I if I don't do anything else with my mana, then, you know, it's the same as if I had spent 5 mana for that spell. Definitely. And I think, you know, that's that's one of the really interesting parts of trying to create mana advantage, right? You have to understand that when you're going to cast these spells... It's not just about the spell in isolation, but the spell in terms of your game plan, your sequencing, how you know how you can fit it into different turns. Right. Yeah. Right? The, pur the purpose why, of playing. Uh, the purpose uh, of playing like these efficient you, removal you, spells. Right, you, exactly. <laughs> you, you're trying to play removal spells in a way that uh, just gives you more options going forward, leaves you more flexibility, and I, I think like this happens a lot. Say when you have like a fatal push and a cast down, right? you have the option to cast the more mana-efficient one, or to, to hold, rather, the more mana-efficient one uh, for the future, because it might sequence better in a turn, but you also might not have a target for it again, or at least not the target you hope for. So I, I think that just, like, this concept comes up a lot, and it's not as cut and dry. It's not something we can just give you answers on, right? There, there's no there's no correct way to do this all the time. And I think that's what makes it such a fascinating topic. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so kind of wrapping up, I, I guess, figuring out what the rules are for using your mana, how, how you want to sequence to maximize your mana efficiency, and then how to break those rules. That's, that's really kind of the, the key to getting better at magic gameplay. Um, I, I don't know if you have anything else to add, Matt, but that's that's no, about I, where I am. No, I think I th we we went pretty in depth on this one. I'm I'm sure that there are other subtopics that we could cover um, regarding this, but I, I think that I mostly mostly said the things that I wanted to say about this topic. Yeah, I I just noticed that this is one of the things that like fundamentally I I often find myself asking after a game, right? Like. You, you wonder so much, okay, did I sequence things correctly? Should I have played... Like, I, I know that I played this in the most man-efficient way possible, but should I have played things differently? How would things have worked out if I'd played things differently? Why did I try to do, you know, what I did? And I, I really think that, like, outside of mulliganing and just making sure you're playing decent decks, this is this is, like, right up there with things that everyone should be trying to get better at. Yeah, definitely. I guess I, I would also like to add that despite the topic being using your mana, um, I think that we actually spent a lot of this uh, talking about how to use your opponent's mana, which is equally important. It, it's kind of the same, right? I mean, every game of Magic is zero-sum, so you, you're forced to actually interact with your opponent, and I, I think that like understanding what... How, how using your mana impacts their mana and vice versa is is really important. Right. 
definitely agree. Yeah, so that about covers it for this week. Uh, if you are interested in giving to us directly, you can check us out at patreon.com slash ccmtg. Uh, I think our next goal... We, we might have fallen back barely below the uh, card of the week threshold, but uh, our, our next goal following the card of the week threshold is a Pro Tour exclusive episode, uh, and the goal is to just get people a really in-depth look at uh, Pro Tour preparation and sort of where that leaves us. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. My name is Michael Hinderocker. You can find me on Twitter at MagicMikeMTG. You can find Matt on Facebook. Uh, his name is Matthew Kling. Uh, you can find Matt on Twitter at the Witchkling. Uh, you can find Spencer on Facebook at Spencer Stephen Howland. You can find Spencer on Twitter at Spencer Thirteen H. Uh, you can find all of us in the Constructed Criticism Family Facebook group. Just uh, send send. A, I, th I think you have to request to join, but uh, you should get approved pretty quickly, and we would love to talk to you there. Uh, you can also join our Discord, which I believe is the... I believe it's just Constructed Criticism, uh, but I'm not 100% sure on that. You can also join the clan on Magic Online by messaging Spencer at Spencer13Dev or Quentin at Earthstripe, which is spelled U-R-T-H-S-T-R-Y-P-E. Uh, so that about finishes it up for today except for would that be good <laughs> if you tweet it michael will read it i mean unless it's really obscene and then you know sure yeah i like i was i was talking about this on our previous recording but i, I think that using a, a phrase like if you tweet it we will read it is just setting yourself up for disaster anyway um, I, I, I think my argument last time was that I didn't say we'd read it out loud on the podcast. I just said we'd read it. And, like, I'll probably read them all eventually. You know, right. if you tweet it, it'll probably get read at some point. I believe one time Casey and I, instead of doing Would That Be Good, just searched Would That Be Bad and read those on the podcast instead. <laughs> it was kind of great. Uh, were, th were there a lot of them? There were a surprising amount. They, were ki they got kind of dark, though. I think one of them was, like, putting down their dog or something, so... Oh man! Or like wanting to, having a dream about like, kicking children or puppies or something. It, it got it got kind of dark, so we haven't yeah. revisited yet. Sounds like it. <laughs> yeah, it it, it was kind of, it it was definitely different. Uh, but I do believe that actually made it into at least one episode. So, you know, you, you never know when we'll switch it up. Anyways, our, our first tweet this week is from Couch Troll Brewing, who says, Thank you for the follow at Spencer13H. The network you built, content you produce, and magic life goal of always improving inspires me and my content and daily life. Yeah, that seems like very nice. I remember uh, Spencer was said that he appreciated it when you know, we recorded the first time. So Yeah, when we recorded the first time and he wasn't you know throwing up instead of recording. Right. But, yeah. Uh, Adam tweets, had a coworker discover his old collection contained a set of unlimited power nine. Meanwhile, I'm still regretting selling my old collection that contains Zendikar fetches that rotated out of standard. So this hashtag would that be good? I think I think it really depends on your perspective. I mean if if you're like me, this no, this wouldn't be good. Somebody else found a set of power nine. That's that's unfortunate. But if it were me Most finding the set of power how much nine. You like your coworker. Sure, yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> But if I were to find Pretty a set of Power Nine, yeah, that would be that would be very good. Yeah, that that does that does sound pretty fantastic. I, I'm I'm not opposed to finding a set of Power Nine, although it seems unlikely based on you know my age and the time that I've been playing. Magic. Well, if you find a set of Power Nine, I think you should make a pact with me right now that you have to split it, and I'll do okay. the same. Deal. Done. That's a good pact. Yeah. It seems really unlikely that either of us ever has to honor that. Oh yeah, almost definitely yeah. not. <laughs> and it has yeah, it, to be regardless. to be clear, it has to be. We have to find it. Like you can't just be like, no, oh, yeah, I just bought a set of Power Nine, and I'm like, oh, half of it's mine. Huh. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's that's not really finding it in the same sense. Uh, Adam also tweets trying to prep myself and my wife to play a modern one K in two weeks should be quite the adventure. Yeah, that just seems great. I mean. 
playing magic is always good, and playing magic with the person that you love is even better. Yeah, I mean, especially if they want to. Yeah, <laughs> it's not even like <laughs> you're not even forcing them, man. Yeah, hopefully she crushes you in the final. That that seems like the best outcome. It's the that's uh, the it's the way you end up in a divorce right there. No, that's you crushing. It's just her in the final. it's just uh, yeah, it's just a one k. It's probably fine. It's better to lose in the final. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I I have my priorities straight. I I know <laughs> lose that match. Yeah. Uh, Spencer tweets, "I'll be on the getting started panel for MTG at Salt Lake Gaming Con today at 4 p.m." Uh, come by to get some free CCMTG tokens and wristbands. Uh, I know Spencer was pretty happy with how this went. Uh, I did not attend myself, but uh, he seemed excited about it. Um, Scotty tweets, Flavor Judge question for Michael. In an actual game of Modern, isn't Lantern just promotion of peace and land development? Building bridges and stopping wars? Is Lantern the hero of modern? I mean, this is a question directed right at you, so why don't yeah. you take it? I don't know. It, so, it might stop wars in the game, but it might create them in real life. Sure. Like, I could imagine a world war being caused by, you know, someone refusing to stop playing Lantern. Like, if we made all the world leaders play magic against each other, I don't know who would play Lantern, but, uh, you know... It, it might cause a war. I, well, I, I don't think Lantern is good for peace promotion. I mean, I would say from a flavor's perspective that all aggressive decks are antagonists, right? So That's sort of true. But Ensnaring Bridge is, like, not the right kind of bridge. <laughs> ensnaring Bridge feels like a real aggressive bridge. It's like, it's it's grabbing things. It's grabbing people. Right. I don't know if you've seen that art from Masters 25, but it's it's not messing around. Yeah, it, looks, it even has that, some flavor That bridge text, looks right? like an antagonist. It even has yeah, some flavor text about this isn't the help I wanted, or whatever. Yeah, that bridge is definitely an antagonist. <laughs> uh, Andrew tweets, just had a meeting with Spencer for the website revamp, and man, is it going to be awesome. Uh, and then Spencer tweets in response, hey, the guy from Would That Be Good is back, and he's building me a website. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm excited I mean, to see what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, getting it, getting any it. any new, uh, you know, website, uh, it seems like it potentially could be good. Yeah, we we probably could use the uh, the website update as well. Yeah. But uh, I'm excited to see what Andrew can do with it. Uh, anyways, that about does it for this week. Did you learn anything sweet? Well. I certainly did the first couple times we recorded. Um, no, I mean, I, we went, we went, I, I, honestly, every time we do one of these, um, I, I learn a lot from the training grounds, just getting to hear uh, your and Spencer's opinions or, you know, whoever else we have on the episode. Like, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and we went even in a little bit of a different direction today with the training grounds. We taught, we brought up a few new points. So I think even today I, I learned new things. So. Yeah, um, I I was surprised as well. I also learned that I couldn't remember everything we said before. Yeah, I mean it it is it is a kind of a bummer to not be able to bring up some of the points that we touched on previously, but I I think we brought up a lot of new good ones as well. So yeah, well, hopefully the uh, the net outcome is is uh, a good training grounds. But I, I think that you know it was a good topic, and I hope that it's helpful to all of you listening. Yeah. See you later. Uh, yeah, until next week. Magic, magic, magic.